Okay. So I know we, yesterday we talked a lot about the difference between Western civilization and Eastern civilization. And what I want you guys to kind of understand is that the customs, the everyday things that we do in the West, which is the, where we're at, right, the type of civilization that we live in, are based off of a large part. There's lots of things it's based off, but for, to a large degree it's based off of uh, Christian values, Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo values, so Jewish values and Christian values. Not exclusively, but a lot of what we do is based off those things, what we consider right and wrong, what we do on a daily basis. Okay, the same is true in Eastern civilizations, the civilizations of India and China. What they do on a daily basis, what they believe is right and wrong, are going to be impacted largely or influenced largely by these two religions, Hinduism and Buddhism. Now, it's not written up here. It's something that you want to write down, though, and that is that both of these religions are founded in India or originated in India. We're going to talk about Hinduism first. We're going to look at both of these a little bit here, but we're going to look closely at Hinduism before we get into Buddhism. Hinduism was not founded by any one person. Okay, it's, uh, it's carried into northern India by the Aryan people that we said migrated into that area around 1500 BCE. Now, the, the historical thing that we do when we look at religions is we kind of give a start date when we feel like that religion was begun to be practiced, and that's 3000 BC for Hindus, which, according to historians, would make it the oldest religion in the world. Here's where things get a little bit more complicated. If you're a Hindu, you don't think your religion began in 3000 BCE. You believe that your religion began at the beginning of time, right? If you're a Jew or a Christian, you feel the same way. Your religion is as old as time, right? Genesis starts the creation of the world. God said, let there be light. That's when your religion begins. But understand that historians, they don't look at things that way. They look at, hey, when did this religion begin to be practiced by people? So it doesn't necessarily make it true. It's up for you to make out on your own. But for Hindus, for historians, we say that Hinduism begins in 3000 BCE. The first step in the development of Hinduism is that teachers begin to interpret and teach hymns, songs dedicated to, uh, we'll get into what they're dedicated to in a minute, but from a book called the Vedas. The majority of Indians today practice some form of Hinduism. 1.2 billion people practice this faith, making it the third largest religion in the world. Parker, what was the largest religion in the world? We've already said this. Most people, most practiced. Not today. We didn't say it recently. It was our last unit. Yes. Christianity. Very good. What is the second largest religion practiced? Braden. Islam. Very good. And those are both monotheistic faiths. So three, the two largest religions in the world are monotheistic, meaning they believe in one God. Hinduism, um, it, we consider it a polytheistic faith. It's more complicated than that. But they believe in multiple gods and goddesses. Buddhism. Notice the date, circa 600 BCE, which just means we don't have an exact start date, so we just think it begins around 600 BCE. And it's in a, a way for us to understand it a little bit easier is that it's kind of a spinoff from Hinduism, right? It's founded by Siddhartha Gautama, who becomes known as the Buddha, which is translated to the Enlightened One. And to, it also originates in India, but it is not really practiced in India today. In fact, it is practiced mainly in China, Japan, and then other southeastern countries like Vietnam and Laos and Thailand. Tibet, almost entirely Buddhist. But today, 535 million people practice Buddhism today, and it still really influences those eastern Asian countries. So, like, like, for example, like China. thing that doesn't let me click when I've got the recording going. All right, you guys go ahead and write for a minute. There's a lot of information there. 
but we're talking about a really complicated religion that's very different than the one that we know or the ones that we're more familiar with. So there's a lot of information that are associated with that. So get that down for me, and we'll talk about it here in how long, Julia? What do you think? Three minutes? How about we do four minutes? <clears throat> okay, the core beliefs and the concept of reincarnation in Hinduism. The first thing we want to talk about is Brahman, which is, you know, if you begin to talk about Christianity or Judaism like we've already done, the first thing you've got to identify is their belief and, and, their, and a deity, right? Which we said, Christianity, Islam, 
and Judaism are all monotheistic faiths, meaning they believe in one God. And in a way, you could almost argue that Hinduism is also a monotheistic faith, even though we don't consider it that. We consider it a polytheistic faith, and we'll get into the reason why in a minute that we do. But the most important concept to the Hindus is this concept of Brahman, which is that there is a spiritual force that exists in the universe, and it is literally inside everything and connecting everything. And it is the goal of Hindus to eventually be reunited, that their life would end, and that they would become just this, a permanent part of this spiritual force that they call Brahman. Now, I, I try to compare that to some things we might be familiar with, right? And the one that always pops in my mind is Star Wars. Who's seen Star Wars? Okay. Uh, what, is, uh, the, uh, what is, the? what is I guess, the order that is the religious order in Star Wars? It's a major part of the film. Okay, so that would be, those are all like uh, governments or organizations. What is the thing that sim that's most similar to a religion that we see in Star Wars? Okay, the Force, and who practices or who tries to become close with the Force? Yeah, the Jedi, very good. Or the bad guys, what are they called? The Sith. The Sith, right. Uh, but both of them believe in a, a, like a spiritual force that connects all things, right? So that is not by accident. The author and creator of Star Wars, George Lucas, was influenced by the Hindu religion. And he's kind of showing that with the Jedi faith, right? Which they're trying to become one with the force. You hear that a lot. So when we say spiritual force, it's, it's not really coincidental. It's, uh, it was done purposely. But, so that's kind of what uh, the way I try to understand it better for me. But notice, it's a pretty complicated idea. It's not really simple. And many historians believe that because it's so complicated, that as time progressed, Indian people began to create gods and goddesses, or not really create, but chose gods and goddesses to represent different parts of Brahman, the spiritual force, so they could better understand that. We looked at some of those yesterday, or on the 3D activity. Brahma was the creator, so he represents creation. Vishnu was the preserver. So he represented stability. And Shiva was the destroyer, right? Represented natural disasters, but also creation as well, which is complicated. We don't necessarily need to get into that. And then Ganesha is mentioned on here, who represents wisdom. I've always mentioned her because she's one of the more famous gods and goddesses in, in American culture. There are two sacred texts. We said the Vedas already. They kind of originate. That's the beginning of the Hindu faith. But the Upanishads explain some important concepts. They explain Brahman, the gods and goddesses, and probably one of the more important things, which is reincarnation. Like we said, though, the thing we need to understand here is that the goal for Hindus is to seek or to achieve moksha, which is uh, universal peace or reunification of the soul with Brahman. So let's look at reincarnation. How does a Hindu get to moksha? They must be born multiple times, reborn into different life forms. And many Hindus believe that that could mean animal form. That's a lower life form than human form. And eventually, if you live good as an animal, I know this is hard for us to kind of grasp, then you would be a human. And then if you live well as a human, eventually the, the cycle of death and rebirth, death and rebirth ends and you achieve moksha. In order to be reborn in a higher status though, you must have good karma, which is decided by the deeds in your current life and your status. In order to have good karma, you must be decent and you must obey your dharma. And your dharma is your duty, your personal responsibility, which is dictated by your social status. So in, the Indi in India, or at least in the early times, this is changing today in modern day times, but in early times, the idea is if you're in a lower social class, which uh, for, in our society, is decided based off of your economic status. So basically, if you're born in, uh, in, a, in a, let's say, a, a lower income family, then you would not seek to become in a higher income, you would seek to be the best lower income person you could. So. 
So a lot of times throughout history, people who are in lower income situations are servants, right? They, are, they serve other people, whether that's in restaurants today or in ancient times, literally servants, right? So the idea in the Hindu faith, Amelia, is that you would be a good servant, and then in your next life, you'd be born into someone who has servants. Does that make sense? And that's how you achieve good karma. Now, if you're someone who had tried to live above your station in life, that would bring bad karma, and then you would be go down a social class and reborn. You'd be born uh, in a lower life form. So a person's dharma depends, like we said, on their status and role in society. What time is it? Nine ten. Let's see. Let's we'll look at some pictures here. Uh, these are representations, the gods and goddesses that we talked about. Ganesha is down here. You can see she has the, the elephant face, which is why she's one of the more iconic images in Western culture uh, for, uh, for Hinduism. Not, not that she's very more important than any other ones. I'm pretty sure, and I'm not positive, okay? I like to, like to let, let you guys know where I, what, about things I don't know, but I think that's Brahma, the creator. And I think yesterday we said that this was Vishnu, the preserver, right? And then uh, Shiva, I don't know which one Shiva is up there. Yeah, Eli. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, we, uh, like I said, there's there's a lot of gods and goddesses here, and I always want you guys to understand my limitations, and from what I learn and what I know, and and I try to get I try to learn more and more every year, but I don't know a lot of those what those gods and goddesses are. This is a Hindu temple, okay? And I do want you guys on your test to be able to tell me the difference between a Hindu temple and a Buddhist stupa. So kind of look at that, familiarize yourself with it. We've got another one. Notice the similarity in architecture in both of them, right? Really intricate, uh, really Asian looking, okay? Go back and look at this one here again. And again, we're just gonna see some, some common concepts. There are some religious differences between the Hindu temples and the Buddhist temples. We don't necessarily need to know that. That's just what these people were created to represent their gods. They're, they're, it's their church, right? If we're looking, again, making a comparison to Western civilization. That's what they're trying to uh, represent as holy or sacred. This is Sanskrit, and like we mentioned it before in the notes, it is the, considered a holy language, and that's just an excerpt from the Vedas. And then this is reincarnation artwork of it, and it's just supposed to show how these people lived in all different times of life, and they are dying and being reborn in different periods, and then eventually this guy's achieving universal peace, achieving moksha down there at the end. And then, of course, karma. And this concept is in Western religions. And the concept is, let's see if you guys can figure it out. Uh, in the Bible, does it ever talk about what goes around comes around? What are the, what's the verse? Y'all know what it says? Okay, it, it's uh, you reap what you sow, right? Which in other words, if you, it's an agricultural metaphor. If you sow something, you put it in the ground and then it grows and you reap the benefits of that, right? So if you sow bad things, Bad things come around to get you, and the same concept exists in the Hindu faith. Okay, next week we'll come back and we'll talk about monks on Monday, okay, which are very important to uh, both Hinduism and Buddhism. So we're done. Uh, we don't have time to do the Lord View activity today, and we will. Hope you guys have a good weekend. Yes.